Welcome to another in the Accidental Null series, Men Are Stupid and I'm One of Them. <laughs> My name is Dan Farron. I am one of the producers of Story Salon. Um, I asked Beverly if I could go first so I could set the bar for nervousness, stammering, all the other things that I don't want you guys to be, feel bad if you do it. So I figured if I come up first and do it, then that'll get it out of the way so no one else will be nervous. So. <laughs> one night after a show that I was hosting at Jennifer's, where this uh, show had started off at one point, um, I walked up to this new guy named Steve and complimented him on his story. He looked at me and said, when you host, you say what you feel up on stage, don't you? And I thought, oh shit, I've insulted someone again. Um, and I said, yeah, you know, I promised my wife I won't do that, but I keep doing it sometimes over and over again. And Steve looked at me and he smiled and he said, you should keep doing it. I like it. My friendship with Steve was made up of great little moments. Uh, sometimes I enjoy when I would introduce him, we would have a little conversation either on our way to or from the stage. Uh, sometimes when Beverly was introducing me, I would walk up to him and start critiquing the show. Just because he was such a good audience and he always thought that was the strangest thing. He'd always say to me, someone's being introduced. And I said, yes, I know who's being introduced. It's me and he's not that good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> One time I was producing a show here uh, about stand-up comedy, with people who was involved in stand-up comedy talking about it. Um, as we all know, um, Steve's father was uh, the great Henry Morgan. And Steve had mentioned in passing about his famous father from time to time. And I went up and asked him if he would mind doing a show where he would tell a story about his father. Um, I looked at him and couldn't tell quite how he was feeling about that at first. Steve had this thing I used to refer to as jackpot. And he was like an old time uh, uh, one armed bandit that you would pull the handle and like you would see the wheel start to turn and you had no idea what he was going to say until that third wheel clicked in. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, sure. Now around that same time my father was very ill and I was telling a lot of stories about my father. And Steve got up and the first thing he said, I've never forgotten this, is he said, when Dan asked me if uh, I would like to tell a story about my father this week, I thought, well, why doesn't he tell a story about his dad? <laughs> and then I realized, oh, wait, he does. <laughs> and he produced this TV guy cover of his father and told this amazing story. But that's what he always did. Steve Robinson never told a bad story. He was a great audience. If you got him to laugh, it was a real compliment. A compliment from him on your story was high praise indeed. And I seem to remember that he would actually remember lines from other people's stories and sometimes 10 years later would <coughs> recite them back to them exactly. When I would introduce him, you could hear a murmur sweep through the audience, like Mickey Mantle stepping into the yeah. on deck bat. Yeah. Or Willie Mays. Yep, or Willie Mays. <laughs> I hope one day people think of me the same way that I think of Steve. And that is, he was always supportive, and he was always kind. January 13th was my birthday. When I woke up early that morning, I had received a note from Steve saying, Happy birthday, Dan, and good wishes always. Sorry I can't be there to celebrate. And I wrote back and said, Thanks, Steve. I am actually taking tonight off from Story Salon because now that I'm 60, I can't stay up past 7.30. <laughs> and Steve wrote back and he said, I actually do know what you're talking about that then I'm glad I won't miss you. Have a great day. <laughs> Two days later, I received a late birthday gift, a book called The Comedians. Um, when I opened it up, up in the far right corner, in this picture of this, this whole collage of comedians, there was a little small picture of Henry Morgan. When I read inside the book, they talked about how Henry Morgan was a radio personality that everybody wanted to be like, they would copy him. And that he inspired such legendary greats as Sid Caesar and Mort Saul. And you know what? Here at Story Salon, 
Steve will always be an inspiration to all of us and influence all of us as a person and as a writer. Steve may not have been able to date, but he sure as hell could write. I'm Beverly Mickens. Um, I met Steve when we were still doing this show at the Coffee Fix over on Moore Park and Whitsit. And I was introduced to him by Melissa Lee, one of our uh, pretty regular storytellers. And she came over to me and introduced him and, uh, you know, I told him what the deal was with, you know, what, and, and the rules of the show were. And he nodded his head very sagely and he said, that'd be good. <laughs> I have a lot of stories. <laughs> and quite honestly, my first inclination was, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Just so I don't look hideous, it's only because so many people come over to me and tell me, oh my god, I have a thousand stories. And they show up and tell their stories for two weeks, never see them again, all right? They fall off the face of the earth. This was not the case with Steve. He showed up on a regular basis, and I was, like everybody else, knew, like in the heart of our hearts, that we were seeing someone who was extraordinarily gifted at storytelling. One of the things that I loved about Steve was that he so allowed himself to be flawed and sloppy and raunchy <laughs> and full of grace and full of dignity and wonder. He was definitely not one-dimensional. And he had the thing that one time this dramaturge, when I was trying to work on a one-person show, told me about 10 years ago. Um, they said, the audience has to see themselves in your stories. They have to be in there, in your story. And I knew that I felt like that in all of Steve's stories. I had the greatest desire in the world, and I'm so sorry that this will not happen now. Um, I, I'm not a fan of driving, for those who know me. I don't like to drive. Um, I'm not a fan of the desert. Have no interest in the desert. <laughs> that, that is not my milieu. <laughs> but I so wanted to go with Steve in his car. <laughs> At night. And I just wanted to drive with him through the desert through all those places he had talked about. Because even though he had painted it so well as a story, I wanted to be there with him, both of us breathing at the same time. I didn't even care if we didn't talk. In fact, I figured it would probably be a little bit awkward. Um, but I just, to, <laughs> to sit next with him, to sit next to him in the seat as he drove, and just, I imagined us going through this inky darkness, not talking, but me being next to him, and knowing that I was experiencing the love that he felt for this kind of thing. Um, I remember, <laughs> um, when we were still, this is when we were still back in the fix, and uh, I had come up with what I thought was a brilliant, a scathingly brilliant idea. <laughs> um, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if we did one night, if I got all the girls together, and we did a night of my date with Steve. <laughs> Each of us <laughs> would take Steve out somewhere, you know, where we wanted to go. Like, I thought, great, I would take him bowling. Somebody else would take him out to a restaurant. Somebody would take him to a movie. And then we would come up and do a story about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, that idea was to bomb, all right? To bomb. And I was so excited, my eyes just blazing with joy and, and light. And I rushed over and I told Steve, and he was so appalled. <laughs> appalled. Luckily not offended, but appalled, so I, I think that was okay. And I tried to explain to him the reason behind it and how much fun it would be. Again, certainly not to make fun of him, but all of us had a great, great affection for Steve. And what fun would it be to go out on a date? Husbands be damned. We didn't care. Well, it didn't happen. So those are two things I missed. I miss going out on a date with Steve. I miss being in a car with him driving through the desert at night. Um, and I will tell him because I know that his spirit 
and his love and his generosity is here right now, that that really is the soul of the story salon, that he was so willing to expose himself, so willing to simply be who he was, and he allowed us all to be who we are as we're telling our stories. So, um, you know, I remember um, after 9-11, Rudy Giuliani, somebody asked Rudy Giuliani something, and, and he made some um, remark of, um, it's all too much to bear. And sometimes it does feel too much to bear. But I know we have the story salon, and Steve lives in every word that we say. Thanks. Even finer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, don't start the clock on me yet. Uh, my name is Frank. I'm the brother from Tahoe. You can applaud. Um, before I, I tell my story, I just want to say how much Steve really, really enjoyed Story Salon. He was always calling me, telling me about his last story or someone else's story. He always, I came once years ago and I realized how much fun this was. He was so burnt out on stand-up that you guys really revived him. He really enjoyed coming here. He, had, he didn't do well with deadlines, but he did very well with your deadlines <laughs> and your time limits as well. So I wanted to thank you for that. We also, my wife and I, bought a couple bottles of his favorite wine from Zaka Mesa. We're going to pour it out the back there. We'd like everyone to have a sample and just to do your own kind of toast for Steve. You can start the clock now. <laughs> My name's Frank. Um, Steve and I have been brothers for about 43 or 60 odd years on earth. We met in Chico, Chico State, and we realized we were cast in, this, in a play, ironically enough, called A Good Man is Hard to Find. We quickly realized that we had more interest than just beer and girls. We enjoyed 60s TV. We enjoyed KFC. <laughs> baseball, even though he liked the Dodgers. And especially Star Trek. A typical day for us in Chico was after we got done with all that college stuff. We would go buy a bucket of chicken. We'd go home. We'd watch the news, and then we'd watch a rerun of Star Trek, the original series. And then we'd spend the rest of the night with beer discussing the philosophical, psychological, and moral ramifications of James C. Kirk and the Prime Director. <laughs> we did other stuff, too, and we got to be friends. And then along the way, we started developing our own idea of a series, of a TV series. We called it Five Boys in College. And these five boys would be set in Chico. One would like the Dodgers, one would like the Giants. And they would have various adventures, but mostly they would sit around drinking beer, discussing the philosophical philosophies <laughs> and moral ramifications of James C. Kirk and the Prime Directive. <laughs> well, after doing this for about a year or so, we decided maybe we should develop this more professionally. So we decided to take three days off. We flew down to LA and tried to sell our stories. And through a combination of luck and chutzpah, we were able to get a, a interview with Al Burton, who was in charge of new products for Norman Lear, and this is 74, and he, that's all in the family that was like top notch. And he said, I'll give you five minutes, and he gave us an hour. Wow. He really liked our story. There, this is before Animal House, so the idea of college life, especially from the, the inside, was really novel, and he asked us a lot of questions, he read our script, he really liked what he said. He closed by saying, you gotta move. You gotta move, you gotta be close to the product. We went, oh, okay, that's probably good. <laughs> so we quit our jobs, we moved to LA, and he never returned our phone call. <laughs> <laughs> didn't return our, our letters. If there was email, he wouldn't have sent those either. And sure enough, three months later, there was a pilot based on our idea on TV. Only this time there were three boys. And we contacted a lawyer and the lawyer said, there's nothing you can do. You know, ideas are, you know, open currency in LA. If you tried it, they'd sue you, even though we had a register with the writer's guild. So, uh, luckily for us, we think, it didn't get picked up. And we like to think that the reason why it didn't get picked up was because those three boys did not drink beer and discuss the philosophical, psychological, and moral ramifications of James C. Kirk and the Prime Directive. And like I said, I've known Steve for, oh God, for 43 years. And during that time, we shared a lot of time together and a lot of memories.
good, bad, and routine. And I know that um, by knowing Steve, that I laughed more, I laughed more often, and I laughed better by just knowing him. Oh. So, thank you. I'm Ellen Cox. I titled mine because Steve liked to title his stories, and my, my title is Theme Night with Steve Robinson. Once a month, Story Salon has a theme night, and when I was quite new, the theme I suggested was voted on and won. My winning theme was Lessons We've Learned from the Animals in Our Lives. <laughs> Before the show, Steve very diplomatically approached me and asked if he could go first. I asked why he was asking me, wasn't the order of performers up to Beverly? Steve then patiently explained to me that if your theme is chosen, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> However, he wanted the honor and Beverly had told him that for him to do so, he had to get the okay from me. <laughs> Seeing as I was unaware of the going first theme night tradition, and still Steve recently educated me, I of course gave my okay. Steve was the opening story that night and I was to follow. Steve's story, the one that went first, was how much he hated the thief. <laughs> and he was not looking forward to spending the evening listening to, as he put it, cute pet stories. <laughs> he even added names, I can't remember specifics, but they're like Fluffy the Cat and Cutie the Cockatoo. <laughs> Virgie, if you ever find that story, I would love a copy. Okay. <laughs> I got to follow that. Fortunately, my story wasn't about pets, but cows. On our dairy farm once, a barn burned down, and my father had no problem getting the cows out of the barn, but he had a problem keeping them out. They kept trying to run back into the burning barn. My lesson from those cows was a realization of how much that bizarre behavior resembled my love life. <laughs> My fondest memory of Steve is the look on his face during that story as he sat front and center. I knew at that moment with that big grin on his face that I had found my tribe. <laughs> that was a good night, no cute pet stories as Steve Robinson had feared. Years after that, Steve wrote a book and I had him sign mine. I did not understand the remark he wrote, but didn't bother to ask as he was surrounded by his many admirers at the time. I figured I'd just ask later. That later never happened, and when getting the news of his passing, I, like many of us, reached for his book to reread those classics. I also reread his remark written years ago and years after my first theme night, and I finally realized what he was referring to. He wrote, please forgive me for the pet comment. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Tony Figueroa. Hi. What's that? If I'm, yeah, yeah. It wasn't a, a question. Uh, thanks, you know, I always like starting a eulogy with you know, audience participation. Which, oddly enough, this is not the first time that's happened. So, uh, I started with Story Salon in 2004. And I told a, 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 a series of stories, and um, I got to one which was about a road trip with a friend of mine, and we were going to drive from L.A. all the way up to uh, San Jose, and then we were going to go through Tuolumne County, and then South Lake Tahoe, and then Reno, and then back to L.A. And on the drive, the news that we kept hearing on the radio was about the Mustang Ranch being seized by the IRS. So you guys remember that? Some of you are old enough to remember that? So that was a lot of our conversation on the drive. 
And my friend kept talking about how they should just legalize it and tax the shit out of it. And as we got close to Reno, he said, you know, I really would like to see one of those places. Now, I had just started dating Donna. The idea of going to one of these places was not that great of an idea for me because somehow I knew she would find out. <laughs> and, but he said he wanted to go, so we went. The Mustang Ranch was locked up. Uh, we were told by some people at a hotel in Reno that all the girls were working at the old bridge ranch, which was across an old bridge from the Mustang Ranch. So we, we drove over there and we were buzzed in and uh, a girl came up to me, a girl came up to him, and uh, I said, I really can't. And then that girl, that was mine, went to him and said, well, maybe uh, both of us should be with you. And uh, he reminded me at that point that I owed him $100. <laughs> anyway, I tell the story uh, to Story Salon, and when the Mustang Ranch comes up in the story, I hear <laughs> And it kind of threw me off, and I didn't know why it was, you know, why the Mustang Ranch got one person applauding. And uh, then I, I talked to Steve afterwards, and uh, that's when I found out that he lived in Lake Tahoe. I lived in Lake Tahoe. We were comparing a lot of notes. He told me he had a story about going to a brothel, and I would eventually hear that story uh, several times when we would take uh, Story Salon on the road, or it's also in Why Stevie Can't Date. And, uh, I was inspired by Steve's story to tell my Lake Tahoe story. I was always calling it the Steve Robinson story. It was about uh, when I worked at Harris Tahoe, and uh, there was um, the first time I worked swing shift, we went bowling, we went to a nightclub that didn't check IDs, and there was a girl named Marlena. Uh, let's just say Marlena used me to get back at her boyfriend. <laughs> and I wrote the story out and, uh, and I really liked it and I showed it to Donna for grammar and punctuation and spelling and, and then Donna said, this is a great story, you're not telling it. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, it's kind of my tribute to Steve Robinson. She said, well, you can show it to Steve. And so I did and I remember at the end of an evening, uh, I gave it to Steve in the back, and as the coffee fix was clearing out, and you know, I could see at what part he was reading, and then he'd be chuckling, you know, and and uh, we had a nice chat afterwards, and very nostalgic about Lake Tahoe, and then he told me, "Yet yeah, we all have our Marlena in our lives." Uh, yeah. But the fact that you know Steve liked you know my road trip story and all that, and he came to me, and he told. For a lot of the storytellers here, the first time a professional writer gives you praise, it is the most amazing thing in the world. So when you have a Steve or a Julio Martinez or a Joseph Doherty tell you how good your story was, it really means so much. Uh, I think my favorite Steve moment, uh, I don't remember the story he was telling. Uh, Steve had already uh, divorced Virgie and already broke up with Marsha. <laughs> Uh, right in the middle, Virgie and Marsha were sitting next to each other, and then the producers were on the other side of the counter at the fix looking, waiting for something to happen, not paying attention to anything Steve's talking about, but Steve, in the course of his story, references his book. And at that point, Marsha said, I wish I'd read the book. <laughs> full voice, and then Virgie said, I am the book. <laughs> and then there was like this perfect high five between the two X's, right in the middle of the room, yes. And I don't know if you rehearsed that, or if that was purely organic. It was organic. It was organic. <laughs> Thank you. But it was just one of those moments, and you had to be there. Uh, two quick things. First of all, uh, my wife Donna wrote uh, a piece about Steve on her blog, uh, Adventures of a Reluctant Writer, and she has it posted on the Story Salon website. And uh, finally, I'm sorry, on the Story Salon Facebook page. Thank you, dear. <laughs> You're always right. Uh, uh, finally, uh, 
When my brother turned 50, one of the things I gave him was a copy of Why Stevie Can't Date. And I had um, Steve sign it before I went to the big 50th birthday party. And uh, on the flyleaf, uh, my brother's name is uh, Ruben, but everybody calls him Speedy. Uh, so it said, to Speedy, please don't think all of Tony's friends are like this. <laughs> Steve Robinson. <laughs> And yeah, um, not all of Tony's friends are like this. And when you have someone like this, you gotta cherish them. And you gotta be very grateful that they were in your life. Thank you. Hi, I'm Richard Johnson. Hi, Richard. Mm -hmm. I'm actually doing a story that I did almost 10 years ago. Uh, it was on 621 of 06, and both uh, Steve and I were divorced at the time. So, anyway. As many of you know, I've been going through a pretty emotional divorce this last year. And believe it or not, tonight is the anniversary of the time of when my wife asked me to go. I took a lot of time trying to figure out what I wanted to say tonight, whether to rant about this inauspicious occasion, trash my wife, or try to win a little sympathy. None of them felt quite right. So instead, I decided to talk about something a little more important, a little more germane to the group as a whole. Steve Robinson. <laughs> or specifically, why I wanted to be more like Steve Robinson. Yes, I'm talking about our Steve. Steve of Why Stevie Can't Date, and many other humorous uh, tales of Nevada and elsewhere. Strange, funny, esoteric road trips that take you where many would normally fear to tread. What always impressed me about Steve and his, was his devil-may-care fuck-it attitude. <laughs> he never seemed to take anything too seriously, and that's a good thing. All I ever do is obsess about everything. <laughs> Did you know that Steve's ex asked him for a divorce about a week after mine asked me? But most of you heard about it first because while well, I was sequestered away at home, wailing and gnashing my teeth and packing, Steve came in and told an amusing anecdote about how he and his wife were going their separate ways. While I was struggling to find an apartment, Steve found Marsha. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, I, I don't begrudge Steve his Marsha. They are a great couple, and Marsha is a lovely woman, but I want a Marsha. <laughs> I had a Marsha for a short time, but all it proved was I was not ready for a Marsha. Too much crap going on up here right now. Ah, uh, but if I was more like Steve. Steve has managed to maintain a great sense of whimsy through all his travels and travails. I seem to have lost mine about two days after my ex gave me my walking papers. Steve has been a strange, shining example of cool, which I can only vainly aspire to. I've only seen him have the smallest case of anxiety the week he was laid off from his job at TV Guy, but that seemed to last pretty much less than a week. Because the next time I saw him here at Story Salon, he was right back to being a paragon of tranquility. Me, if I lost my job while going through a divorce, you'd be peeling me off the walls. Now granted, I am wound a bit tighter than Steve. That may be because he has a couple of years and a second divorce under his belt. And experience is always a calming factor in life. It may be because he has a stronger support system in place than I do. It might be because of some of the recreational substances he occasionally invents. I unfortunately do not have that last option. I'm actually deathly allergic to many of them. Hell, I, I can't even wear hemp clothing uh, if you get my meeting. Did you know that I've actually had a few people say they were frightened of me? And, what, and while Steve is bigger, taller, and could probably take me in a fair fight, you'd never hear anybody say that about him. He had such a Hamish Puma. <laughs> All I know is that whatever it is that gives Steve his zen-like quality, his Steveness, if you will, I want a small piece of it. So, as of this moment, I pledge to be more like Steve, to study at the feet of the master, to be more at one with the duck than the camel. I realize how absurd this life truly is, and to make my way through it with as much grace as humanely possible without popping a gasket. Steve, my friend, 
You are a shining example for us all. And Story Salon, if not the world, is a better place for having you in it. Semper Fi. <laughs> Steve came up after we finished that night, and he asked me for a copy of this. I have it. <laughs> and it was one of the best feelings I've ever had. My name is Mrs. Norman Main. <laughs> I'm Mike Lambert, and I'm very um, honored to be standing here. And I'm very grateful to see Virgie and Marsha and Frank and Barbara. It's great. The cover of Steve Robinson's book features a heart with a jagged break going down the center of it, carved deep, like the deep craggy crevices of the Colorado River as it cuts a crooked line between Arizona and California. And just like the cuts of the Colorado River into the hardened layers of granite and limestone that had taken millions of years to build up and millions more to cut through, Steve wore his heart with its beautiful, deep-colored, multi-hued cuts, jags, sharp edges, and worn down gullies, not so much on his sleeve as, on, as in his face. His beautiful, smiling, injured, understanding, forgiving, welcoming face. Mount Rushmore should only have such a face in it. Okay, that's the wrong state, but still. <laughs> Steve emanated humor. It flowed out of every pore. But it was kind humor, loving humor, humor that cut without injuring, that came from his heart, tempered by winds of longing and rivers of personal reverses that never seemed to pull him down, but always gave him even more patience and compassion and love for people in pain. Even at his most deadpan, sarcastic, and caustic, there was love for all of us trying to make it down the river and over the white waters without crashing on the rocks. Steve was the gayest straight man I ever met. <laughs> Not gay in that canned, forced, stereotypical, boxed-in, insult humor, self-hating, dime-a-dozen, will and grace kind of way. <laughs> you can see I'm bitter. <laughs> Gay in the sense that he got us, us gay folks. They say that Bill Clinton was the first black president. I think Steve Robinson was the first gay storyteller at Story Salon. <laughs> he totally understood us, which is to say that for him there was nothing to understand. It came so effortlessly to him, it was entirely natural. There had been no struggle to get there. Steve loved gay people and that was that. He was fond of outcasts. He loved us more than most gay people I know, certainly more than I. That's what was special about him to me. He accepted me more fully, more naturally, and more effortlessly than I was able, ever able to accept myself, which is to say, he helped me. My first night at Story Salon, he came up to me after and asked me to join him and some friends at the Oyster House for drinks, and I knew I was in. If Story Salon is a soft, sweet bosom, Steve Robinson is the cleavage. <laughs> Because he goes deep. <laughs> it's true. I'm happy to say that Gerard and I did get to visit him in Laughlin, where he was working at the Riverside Casino as a blackjack dealer. After his shift ended, he took Gerard and me to probably the seediest bar in town, <laughs> which in Laughlin is really saying something. <laughs> because that barrel is very deep. <laughs> and it takes a long time to scrape the bottom of it. <laughs> Fluorescent lights, threadbare pool tables, outdated grimy slot machines, and a clientele that redefined the words throw in the towel. <laughs> we drank and talked and told stories over some of the worst cocktails I ever tasted in my life. And do you know what? We could have danced all night. <laughs> If it weren't for Steve, Gerard and I would never have visited Oatman, Arizona, a tiny former movie set of a mining town about a 40 minute drive south of Laughlin, with a rundown hotel that Clark Gable and Carol Lombard honeymooned at, a town with burrows that roamed the streets like homeless people looking for handouts, <laughs> left over from the movie days. 
He told us the bar, he, he told us the bar to go to and gave us the bartender's name and we got there and we sat and had beers midst a room full of biker people. <laughs> people on the outskirts, people on the margins, people who had given up or should have. <laughs> the kind of people Steve Robinson loved and valued and saw beauty in. Craggy, creviced, worn down, and colorful people. He wasn't a saint, thank God. He was flawed. I'm sure he struggled with demons like most of us do. I never got to know him well enough to know any of that, but it's in his book, it's in his humor, it's in his face, it's in his smile, it's in his heart. And generous soul that he was, he has left us that. His heart, his jagged, broken, beautiful heart. And we'll be okay, better than okay, because we knew him. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marcia Lennox. I have a lot of stories. I picked one because Valentine's Day is right around the corner. I'm not romantic and I'm not crazy about surprises, so it's pretty remarkable that Steve and I made it past the first few dates. <laughs> romantic surprises are kind of his thing. We started dating in September, though we didn't go public as Story Salon until December. The following February, Valentine's Day fell on a weeknight. I was working at LA School District headquarters downtown at the time. While I spent most weekends at Steve's, the rest of the week I spent the night at home in Van Nuys. We tried a weeknight sleepover, but between dealing with driving to his apartment in West Hollywood at 5 p.m. and getting ready for work at his place the next morning, the whole thing was a huge pain in the ass as far as I was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so when Steve suggested that I pack an overnight bag so we could have a nice romantic Valentine's evening, my reaction was something along the lines of, Ugh. <laughs> that heinous drive was the worst way to start off a big sexy evening. No, I said, let's just celebrate on the weekend before or the weekend after. But Valentine's Day was a big deal to Steve. I finally acquiesced, begrudgingly, because I'm not romantic and I didn't want to take those stupid surface streets. A few days after I caved in on the Valentine's plan, my best work friend, Kirsten, asked me if I knew whether I could leave my car parked overnight. Back then, LAUSD had a contract for overflow parking at LA Center Studios across the street, and that's where my parking was assigned. Kirsten parked in the garage att attached to our building, so I asked why she wanted to know, and she told me her boss, Karen, is going to start parking at the studio, so she wants to know because sometimes she works late, or her sister drives her home, or I don't know, it was really confusing. After getting no satisfactory explanation, I said I'd check after work and forgot all about it because her story made no sense, so it didn't stick with me. The next day, Kirsten was a bit upset and kind of twitchy when I told her I forgot, and I kept saying it just didn't make sense that Karen would have to park at the studios. After a few days of this, Kirsten broke down and said, it's not for Karen, it's for Steve. He's planning a Valentine's surprise for you and he wanted to make sure your car wouldn't get towed if you left it overnight. <laughs> He's picking you up and taking you somewhere. I can't say anything else. I've already blown the biggest part of the surprise. <laughs> wait, wait. I, Steve knew of Kirsten through me talking about work, but he'd never met her and I'd certainly never given him her phone number. What the hell was going on? And here's what Kirsten told me. One day at work, her phone rang. It was Steve. And she knew all about Steve from me, obviously, but was a little confused as to why he had her phone number. And he told her that he knew our cubicles were close to each other. So on a hunch, he'd started calling phone numbers that were close to my work number, but one digit off, and kept asking for Kirsten. <laughs> And that's all it took. Convincing her to work with him on a surprise for me was a piece of cake, even though obviously she's the worst liar and co-conspirator in the world. But the fact that he went to that kind of effort to track her down and enlist her help completely won her over. I tried to keep the secret, but Steve knew me too well and saw right through my, ah, I'm kind 
kind of looking forward to Valentine's, even though I'll have to drive in that terrible traffic. <laughs> and he spilled the rest. He reserved a room for us at the Bonaventure Hotel, across the freeway from where I worked, and made dinner reservations at the rotating restaurant on top of the hotel. On Valentine's Day, I ran out of the building with my overnight bag to Steve's waiting car, and we drove over the 110 to the hotel. We checked into our big, beautiful room, done up in relaxing earth tones, but the best thing about it was that it was on the opposite side of, where, of the hotel from where I worked so I wouldn't be reminded of my job whenever I looked out the window. Steve had made sure of that when he made the reservations. He thought of everything. We settled in, showered, changed into our good clothes, and headed up to the restaurant. We had a table next to the window, and our waiter let us know we could spend the entire evening there if we wanted. We saw the entire city below us, and I gave Steve a laugh when, at one point, I went to the bathroom, came back, and couldn't find our table. You know, because... <laughs> Sitting there at the window with piano music in the background, the lights of the city sparkling below, and the man I loved sitting across from me, I had to admit, it was very, very romantic. <laughs> I'm Skylar Lennox, Marcia's daughter. Um, <laughs> also, uh, forgive me, it has been like seven years since I've stood on this stage, so. Okay. Um, during an especially boring part of my Roller Derby League's mandatory meeting at Denny's in Duarte, I decided to scroll through Facebook. Between a BuzzFeed quiz of which Disney princess sidekick am I, and an article about the crazy thing Trump said that day, I saw the post that Steve was dead. I couldn't believe it, but after seeing five posts that said the same thing, I no longer could deny the truth of it. I slowly stood up and went out to the parking lot to weep. Of course, not soon after, the family whose car I was sitting next to came out. I tried to keep my sobs to a minimum, but couldn't hold them in. The father asked me if I was okay, and I told him someone close to me had died. He asked if he could pray with me, and in the moment it felt right. Not for the prayer, so much as for the random experience of it. <laughs> the man proceeded to speak in tongues. what Jesus saw for me in my future. But he wasn't telling me my fortune because as he made very clear, that was witchcraft. <laughs> and prayed over me again. The whole time, his wife was just rocking back and forth saying, mm-hmm, that's, that's right. Oh, baby, yes. <laughs> Praise Jesus. That's right. Praise the Lord our God. Mm -hmm. Oh, child. <laughs> After Jesus' voice stopped telling him about my future and also my mom's health and other things that were quite confusing and in no way applied to me, um, he wished me a good night. They got in their car and they drove off. It was weird and surreal and the absolute perfect thing to happen, for it gives me an excellent story that Steve would appreciate to no end. I met Steve when I was 16 years old. Honestly, he intimidated me. His wry, acerbic wit without charity for a young, impressionable teenager was disconcerting. I think that initial impression made me feel like I had earned something when he gave me a compliment after one of my first story salon stories. His feedback was always thoughtful and never felt that he was just saying something to be nice. I don't think that was ever a motivating factor for Steve. <laughs> Always kind, rarely nice. <laughs> As I grew older and my mom and Steve started dating, I got to know him better. He had this curiosity and wonderment that was infectious. I think those qualities are what made him such a talented writer and storyteller, and also what made you want to be his friend. His qualities of wonderment made you see the world in a completely new way, and it allowed you to experience life in a way that you never thought possible. As I wrote this, something so surreal to write, 
Um, I realize how selfish my memories of Steve are. I'm really sad I didn't get to fully get to know him as I became a card-carrying adult. The Steve I knew will always be, in part, the great dude <laughs> <laughs> who took an interest in my growth as a writer, who believed in my creativity. He never treated me like the youngin, but as an equal. For a teenager, that is invaluable. The gratefulness I have for him is eternal. As someone who was so discerning, saw something in me. Surely I should look harder within myself. His belief in me helped me believe in me. Um, when I got here tonight, my mom gave me some things that Steve had, and one of them was my, um, my college graduation card. And, <laughs> and it was funny because as I was writing this, I couldn't bring myself to to write my favorite memory of him because <laughs> I knew I would be the first one to cry. <laughs> but at my college graduation, they were my, my mom and I were still dating and he was just so humbled to be with us. And it was so confusing to me because he was part of our family. Of course he was going to be in the family pictures and of course he was going to sit next to us. And he gave me a <laughs> care package of sorts with things like coloring, because he said, like, you'll still want to color, <laughs> and perks of being a wolf out flower that I was literally as old as I could be, and it's still being so profoundly, like, amazing. Because I know if I read it now, I wouldn't have gotten the same thing from it. And a Johnny Cash shirt that I still have. <laughs> and, oh, man, those... His, his thoughtfulness and his generosity and his caring, just, it's hard to put that completely and synthesize it, because that was just so much of who he was. I, like you, have his book filled with the stories that made up his strange, chaotic, and fully authentic life. Well, at least I think that's what makes it up, because, well, I haven't actually read it. <laughs> Time, and I really didn't want to read about my mom's boyfriend's sex life. <laughs> but now I have an opportunity, one that I otherwise would have been lost. I have an opportunity to meet him as an adult. You know, and I'm so grateful that his life passion is one that makes him immortal and something that we can all hold on to. Thank you so much. I'm Darren Mangler. Um, right when I came in tonight, Dan made fun of me because I was wearing shorts. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to say that Steve was the only man that had wider legs than me, so we have a brother right there. Um, when I heard about his passing and that he was found at a computer, I was truly hoping that it was some sensational porno that he was watching. <laughs> Uh, or he was just writing another book because I just started reading uh, his book and I have a thousand questions for him now, but that's going to have to wait. Um, whatever you believe in, whether you think when we go there's nothing or we go to the pearly gates or there's 72 virgins, which I'm sure he'd be excited about, <laughs> um, I'd like to think that we're all measured by what we do on the planet and uh, to the people around us. And I wasn't as lucky as most of you to know him that long. I only got him for, what, a couple years? And in that time, all I've ever seen him do is inflict joy. That's all I ever saw, was just an inflicting joy everywhere. <laughs> and a perfect example is um, I went to Laughlin and my uh, parents, uh, my mother and stepfather, want to move there uh, after he retires. And uh, so we went to Laughlin because they were looking at apartments, and they actually looked at the apartments that Steve lives in. And uh, we were at Harrah's, and they went gambling, and I called Steve, and I said, why don't you come down, and we'll watch a football game together. And, um, and we'll have a few beers. And as you know, he doesn't uh, drink, or maybe some of you don't, uh, but he does like marijuana. <laughs> so he came down, and he was completely baked. 
and we were having a great time watching the game, and my parents came over, and my mother and Jim, my stepfather, had questions for him, and Steve was about three seconds after us, so my mom would say, hey, so we want to move here, and we look at your apartments, do you like them? Yeah. <laughs> They're nice. Got a couple of pools. They do stuff at the rec center. It's, yeah, it's, it's really nice. And my stepfather was like, well, are there jobs at the casinos? Do you know anybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of great jobs there. I'll introduce you. So when I told my parents that he had passed, my stepfather was super bummed because he was excited to have a friend already living there. And that was just meeting him for a couple hours, inflicting joy. The next time I went, my film was at the Laughlin Film Festival. And uh, it was a short film. And I called Steve, and I'm like, I have a pass for you. And you get to go to every film for free when you come down. He came down right away, got that pass. And he was so excited because he was such a believer in the arts. And he's such a believer in independent work. And he started just watching movie after movie, block after block. I mean, they show 200 movies there, and he was crushing a lot of them. Yeah. And uh, he came to see my film, and after it was done, we were walking out, and he grabbed my right hand, and he put his left hand on my shoulder, and he locked me in. And he had, and he had my eyes, and he's like, I am so glad I don't have to lie to you. <laughs> He goes, he goes, the writing was the best. You're the best short I've seen so far. Your acting astounded me. I didn't know you were an actor. I just thought you told stories. Uh, it was a triumph. Now, that was a great compliment coming from Steve. But then when I started reading his book and found out that his father was a world-renowned satirical radio host, that his mother worked at the studios, that he was in L.A., I didn't know any about th anything about this. And so now that compliment is 10,000 times the size of the sum. Um, and I so appreciated him for that time. So luckily I got to hang out with him a few times in Laughlin and have a great time. And as I'm reading his book, I figure he lived a great life. Now some people might say that Trump's kids are living a great life. <laughs> They're living an easy life. They don't know what risk is. They don't know what sacrifice is. If they were to start a business and it completely tanked, they would still have $3 billion. <laughs> so trying to explain risk to them would be like trying to ex explain what the color blue is to a blind person. You could tell them, tell them, they would just not get it. But Steve got it. And he lived a great life. And he inflicted a lot of joy. And I'm pretty sure he's going to be well measured. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm Shelley Ann Wooderson. Um, Steve and I shared a birthday. Every September 15th, he would send me a message from some remote location where he was enjoying nature and peace and being alone. And I would send him a message from whatever family event, usually organized for my mother's birthday, which is the following day, that I was involved in. And we both knew who was having a better time. <laughs> I remember Steve from his very first story. I was behind the counter in the back of Jennifer's and he started talking about hiring a prostitute. <laughs> and he had my attention. <laughs> Ever since Steve died, I've seen people mention what a nice guy he was. The thing is, he wasn't a nice guy. He would have been insulted by being called a nice guy. A nice guy tries to please other people. Steve wasn't trying to please anyone else. He was too busy just being himself and being honest to worry about whether he was pleasing anyone else or not. I think that's why I remembered his story. I mean, it's got to be 14 plus years ago and I still remember his story. Not just because he admitted to hiring a prostitute or because the story was hilarious. Not just because the story was sad and dramatic and so well written, but because it was one of the most honest stories I've ever heard. 
He wasn't scared to sound stupid, to admit to human frailty, to be base and low and desperate and at the same time laugh at himself. This last time I saw Steve was here, September 11th for the LA Stories. He wished me a happy birthday and I wished him one. He, we were both planning road trips. And he said he didn't understand why Beverly had booked him for a show when he'd already bailed out of the city. <laughs> of course, he got up and told an amazing story about baseball and the Dodgers. And I didn't realize it was going to be our last joint birthday. And like most of the people I've heard here, I love Steve. But not because he was a nice guy who said happy birthday to me every year, even when everyone else forgot but because he was cruelly honest, even with himself. <laughs> Lila Silver is my name, and I wrote a poem to Steve. Hey, Mr. Robinson. I had a crush on you, Steve Robinson. I was a fan. You were the man who filled story salons, small stage, and delighted women of a certain age with stories that took place in a bar or casino in Tahoe or Laughlin or sometimes Reno. We rode with you across the Mojave at night and listened to you talk of the river that made your new home feel just right. Steve Robinson, you had style. Even in those t-shirts that made everyone smile. <laughs> and that right, wry, raised eyebrow look that made us all want to read your book. Why Stevie Can't Date is a real mystery that will go down in story cell on history. When I came to the coffee fix years ago, I was alone, no friends at my side. When I read my first story, I was nervous and scared, thought after that no one cared, except one person in the crowd came up to me after and said, nice and loud, I liked what you wrote, I hope you'll do more. Since then, you've, hold a you've held a special place in my heart. Oh, Steve Robinson, wherever you are, driving across the celestial desert in a brand new car, or sitting at the heavenly bar smoking a cigar, dealing some cards to angels who gamble and swear and drink, you'll always make me blush and think of you whenever I can as Story Salon's sexiest man. <laughs> If you don't know, my name is Virgie. Hi, Virgie. Hi. I'm uh, not going to be the only one that cries. <laughs> Steve is right here, for those that don't know. I brought his ashes with me. Don't count my five minutes yet, okay? <laughs> brought his ashes here. My daughter's with me, Terry. His ashes are also in me in a way that's professional. <laughs> okay, not his professional. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was there too. Um, we took his ashes and we mixed them with tattoo ink. And Steve coined the phrase for me, an egg-making military biker chick. And it's in his book, Why Stevie Can't Date. Um, he's told many stories about me, and when we first met, he called me trouble, because I was nothing but trouble. So my daughter took his ashes and we mixed it with purple tattoo ink and it says, egg making military biker chick, trouble. <laughs> and his ashes are mixed in with the ink and he will always be with me. Because why Stevie can't date, why Virgie will never marry again. Steve is my last husband. Doesn't get much better than this. And people say never say never, but engagement ring. Steve gave this to me on May 25th, 2003. We're not typical ex-wife, ex-husband. We just couldn't live with each other. He can't date. I can't cohabitate. We were perfect for each other. 
we loved each other and talked incessantly and then did trips together and, and everything. I talked last week um, about why, um, last time I was here, the Wednesday after I found out he died, I came and told about that. On my way home from here, it was moonlight night, stars are out, I'm speeding to get home, telling, oh, Steve, this is beautiful, and I can see why you love to travel in the desert at night. Hate it during the day. Mm -hmm. At night, it's beautiful. I get pulled over by the police going back to Steve's apartment after Story Salon last time. Oh. The same cop that found Steve and oh. walked me up his stairs, pulled me over. Did not give me a ticket. <laughs> just told me to slow down. You do not want to be with him right now. Oh. And I did, and I thanked him. Henry Morgan was Steve's father. A lot of people don't, you know, we were talking about Steve's passing and everything. Well, I want to talk a bit about his beginning. Because when I was going through Steve's apartment, it took me 10 days to go through it, and his computer and his phones and everything, I found a plethora of history that a movie needs to be made someday, sometime. I found letters between his mother and father before Steve knew who his father was. And he didn't know his father until he was 17 years old. Henry Morgan wrote a book, and this is the book from Henry. It says, for my son Steve, I love you, Henry M. Henry Morgan admits that Steve is his in his book on page 10. He says he, he didn't sleep with many women, but he was wide awake for over 100. <laughs> He goes, Mr. Dorble was no bargain either. There were 10 abortions. I always took care of the girls, but there it was, with just one exception, a lovely lady who refused that way out. She explained that she had flown east specifically in order to have my child. As I write, my son Steve is 40. I can cheerfully state about him what my mother used to say about me. He's wonderful, never been on drugs or in jail. I said, I didn't know him. Steve did a stint in jail for DUI. <laughs> Shh. Steve, like me, is an amusing guy and he writes for a living. I'm very fond of him and regret only that he lives in California and I do not. And that was as far as he wrote about Steve. But he was in Steve's life as these letters. When I found these letters, I saw another story and I have all of Steve's stories. So whoever was looking for a story that that um, I can't remember who was on stage saying if I have a story, I do. Yes. I have everything of Steve's. It is not getting thrown out. I have given and hand delivered um, love letters from old girlfriends, love letters from married girlfriends, love letters from uh, old girlfriends, <laughs> and I've handed them all to him. I haven't, and brothers. I have a box for Frank full of stuff. Um, I'm a good ex-wife, but I'm never going to get married to show you how good I could be. Steve got the best, and I went through all of his stuff, and I'm keeping all of his stuff. I even have an Al Hirschfeld of his of Henry Morgan in my house. Um, I don't know what to do with it yet, so I'm not doing anything with it yet. But anybody that had anything, I gave them back their mementos. Even Skyler, that graduation card, gave it all back. So Steve, uh, he wrote. He had hundreds of these pieces of paper. On the back is parts of scripts. He used old scripts as scrap paper. There's thousands of these. So this one particularly says, have I pleased my parents? How am I doing compared to them? My father wrote several books and had his uh, publisher and an agent and an ex-wife who pursued him in court many years. I'm not a household name. What does it all mean? Am I different? Do I care? Not when I'm out there. I'm demographically undesirable. So I grew up, some, not all the way. Oh my God, I'm a crabby old man. Yes, I've become my father, but he made a living out of a crabby old man. That's just a little note. Now, what I found were these old type letters before internet, before anything, even there's a phone number here. It says Diamond Dash Six Seven. That you know when you used to say the name and then the numbers. That's how old these letters are. This one's November eighth, nineteen sixty-three. Steve is born in nineteen fifty-two. This makes him eleven. Dear Henry, what a very pleasant surprise. For information, Henry Morgan is Steve's father. 
Helen Rankin is Steve's mother, and she went by her maiden name. Okay, but she was married once before, before she got pregnant with Steve. And she specifically went to New York to have a baby. Okay. Dear Henry, what a very pleasant memory is to receive your note, and you may be sorry you asked, because this could turn into a six volumes of the recent history of English-speaking Helen Rankin. First of all, everything's just fine. Steve's a husky five foot two, weighing in at 115 pounds. He's a great joy to me and is turning out to be a fine boy. He gets good grades in school and has gone into junior high this year. He's a year ahead of scholastically, an accelerated section of the seventh grade. He attends Campbell Hall in North Hollywood, as do some other children from Woodland Hills, where we live. So I bring the children to school in the morning on my way to work, and the other mothers pick them up and take them home. He's an absolute nut about baseball, a staunch Los Angeles Dodger fan, and a pretty good right fielder in Little League. And then there's a little stuff, and it's like, that just about brings things up to date. Now about you. We keep track a little through I've Got a Secret, and I almost called you a couple of times when you were out here doing the nighttime show, but never mustered the courage. Dear Helen, Odd that you should be without courage when it comes to calling. I thought I was the only one like that, since I never hear from you, even at the time I gave you a slight raise some time back. Henry Morgan paid $100 a month for child support without ever having to go to court. He did that willingly. He wanted to be in Steve's life and take care of his son. I thought you carried a grudge or had simply decided that I didn't exist. Well, there are a few dozen things I would like to know. For one thing, I told you some time ago that I had insurance that Steve could go to college, but I know very little about what really goes on. For example, what does he know? How or what have you explained to him, and what does he think about his background? I imagine these aren't ideal topics for letter writing, but I'd much like to know if we keep passing one another on the way to somewhere else, I'll never find out. Dear Henry, apparently all these years of us has believed that the other was full of resentment and holding a grudge. What fools we've been, and believe me, I'm sorry. Far from carrying a grudge, I am indebted to you for the best thing that ever happened to me. After the initial panic, I found Steve brought me a purpose in life and gave me a good, solid reason for living. I've been the one to gain from this situation because of all the pleasures of watching him develop into a very fine young boy have been mine. He's bright, terribly untidy, a little shy, <laughs> but well-mannered and has a lot of fun. He keeps me hopping to stay in step with the younger generation, and that's healthy. I shudder to think what an empty mess my life would have been without this. So you see, there's no room for resentment. Instead, you hold a very soft spot in my heart, but don't let that frighten you. <laughs> Dear Helen, if you still take pictures, I'm always interested. Send one of you too this time. Dear Henry, you should have seen Steve after talking with you. He glowed with excitement and wished he had thought of more things to say. So this is in February of 1965, so Steve is now 13 years old. He plans for your mid-century Forgive Me celebration all too impressive. Henry Morgan invited Helen to go to his 50th birthday party, and she did. Dear Henry, Basically, he's a good boy with fine intelligence. Your kind of offbeat humor is almost too shy, but above all, he's very sensitive. I know his potential is way above average, and I'm most anxious that he learn to use his capabilities to the fullest. I also know that these next few years are extremely important because the training and discipline he has to learn will set his pattern for the future. After a great deal of thought, I believe the best solution would be military school. Where do we? <laughs> this is his mother wants to send him to military school. After a great deal of thought, I believe the best solution would be military school where he would have male influence along with firm, unbiased discipline. His schoolwork would be watched more closely, which I find difficult when I work. And what he does in the next few years will determine what kind of college the situation he will have. Dear Helen, there comes a time in every mother's life when she thinks military school. <laughs> For some reason, mamas think military school as a place where, through some kind of militarism, magic <coughs> machine, a kid turns into a high-class gent in time for Easter vacation. It doesn't work. 
you go in rotten, you come out rotten. And the military side is, of it is a bruising board. You want to send them to school, send them to school, but not military, mm -hmm. underlined, not. Okay. The time they waste on getting their buttons shiny, they could be using to learn Spanish or karate or stealing. <laughs> All the kids I ever knew were on the least bit aware, aware of anything, managed to get tossed out of military school in a month. The thing to do is to pick out a school that has a high rate of acceptance for its graduates among good colleges. I don't know what Mark's situation he gets. A lot depends on that. That was in 1965 in the summer. Then she didn't answer him. You never answer my letter. What school? <laughs> Where is this? The reason I never want, oh, wait, 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 wait. I know, she give me the five minutes, but hold on a second. One question I've always wanted to ask you for a long time, and since we have had more correspondence of late than ever before, I want to ask it now. Haven't you ever had the desire to meet and know Steve a little? I've wondered about it often. I'm not trying to force anything. It's just curiosity that makes me ask. You've had several opportunities when you've been out this way, but you've never contacted us. I'm sure you've had your reasons, and you don't need to tell me if you don't want to. I simply wondered. The reason I never wanted to meet Steve is simple. When I asked about it some years back, what does the boy know? You said that he'd seen a picture of your first husband and assumed that was, he was, it was his father, and you said that your son had left it that way. Well, what was I to do? How would I act? I didn't know, and you hadn't been in touch, so I assumed that you had no particular desire to see me, and that's the way it's been going. December, 1965. Well, wonders, dear Henry, well, wonders never cease. Each time you write, new facets of you are revealed, and startled to know that I was more fond of you than I never had any difficult remembering, as evidenced by all these years when other men held no interest for me at all. Dear Henry, we must do something now if we're ever going to register for next fall. Please let me know as soon as possible. Dear Helen, only God knows why I don't seem to make myself clear. Yes, register the boy in school. Yes, I will pay for it. Yes, yes. One of these days, we'll, dear Henry, one of these days we'll make a trip to New York and you will meet Steve. You will think, I think you will find the experience pleasant and worthwhile. Best. Steve did meet his father. After he graduated from high school, he did a hitchhiking trip to New York. And then I also found letters that uh, his father and Steve wrote back and forth and back and forth. I just brought the mom letters with me. Um, his dad helped him and critiqued him. Not as pol calmly as sens or sensitive as Steve would like, but that's the brutal honesty of Henry Morgan. And um, he was loved in the beginning, in the during, and in the after. And the love I hear right now, there's nobody else. He's irreplaceable. Someone said he was the, the straightest gay man. <laughs> he was the best gentleman. He was the best lover. He was the best companion just couldn't live together. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this celebration of the life of Steve Robinson has come to an end, but the celebration of the life of Steve Robinson will go on forever. Good night. Thank you very much. Story Salon, people ask how long I'm here for. And the answer is almost always the same. 10 o'clock. <laughs> I drove 300 miles here today. I leave after the show to drive home. I do this because I have a deep-rooted need for applause. 